It's episode 16 of the Mix 6, The Soothing Sounds of Paul Hollywood. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm your Diplo Raptor, and I'm going to let you do it with some slight in the well, foreground for your enjoyment. Uh, cheerio. See you on the other side, guys. So in light of the uh, Trump administration's new proposed budget, Betsy DeVos has kind of been like on a tour of Congress people and testimonies uh, just to fucking like, you know, explain why it's okay to gut so much funding and to give states so much flexibility and choice. And really what it's given us, the consumer, are just endless video, endless videos of more Congress folks just wrecking Betsy Davos. Yeah, I hate that she's still there for it to happen. Right. But if you just made a YouTube channel of Becky Davos getting rhetorically owned, just I crushed. would hammer that subscribe. Button. It would be the only thing that I would watch. And so this week we're choosing to all of the members of Congress and individuals who continue to find ways to wreck Betsy Davos publicly, including the students at uh, I think it was Bethune Cook, mm-hmm. Bethune Cookman, who uh, booed her off stage functionally during a commencement address all of these all of these wonderful things that are happening we're cheersing to all of you for finding public ways to wreck the secretary of education and here's you keeping on dunking on her that's right Welcome to the Mix Six. I'm Caleb. I'm Spencer, and this is the pre-party. Hello. Felt a little long. All right. Uh, anyway, in the pre-party, we get our news out of the way before we get on to our six random conversations during six random beers. Uh, but before we get started on that, we have to have a rating system. So uh, this week, I came up with the rating system. Kirk suggested it. Uh, rather than do an armchair director where I just gush about how much I like the Coen brothers. Which was going to happen. Uh, and it would be a great ten minutes of me just saying, boy, they sure are good. Mm-hmm. Um, they now, really I, get movies. Yeah, Couldn't really anticipate a lot of opposition there. Uh, so we figured, Kirk, we'll give you an entire episode-long influence on the podcast with the Coen brothers rating system. Uh, so I developed the rating system. I want to be clear that the rating system is strictly an integers. If one of your favorites on here, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means it's in between the integers. What the fuck is this? Are you fucking? Are you like trying to avoid the Tarantino backlash that I got? I got. Are you backstopping right y- now? Yes, man. Why, why wouldn't I? Jeez. Like, if you see the guy walk through the minefield and oh hit God, the mines, Caleb, you don't go that way. I thought we were you in go this a together. different way. Jesus, gotta agree with that. <laughs> cool guys. Oh, you know what? I'll sit on this side of the table. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I hope everyone fucking hates your list. So continue. Right. Uh, one is a lady killers. Uh, I guess it looked good on paper. But it was terrible. It was a remake of an Alec Guinness film, right? So yeah. it seemed like it had some legs. And Tom Hanks. Yeah, right. I mean, it looked good on paper. Sure. Didn't really end up that way. Uh, not so sure. Was there weigh-ins in that? Am I, am I making that up? There wasn't a weigh-ins in that? <laughs> I don't remember. It's that. Yeah, yeah. it's it that, that kind of impression. Mm-hmm. Uh, two is a HUD soccer proxy. Love it, but it's developing. Uh, early. Early enough that it's developing. Three is a Raising Arizona. Uh, it's comfortable. It's familiar. Uh, and yet it's sort of... You know, breaking the mold of its time. You know, plus Nick Cage. Pl- plus Nick Cage, solid Nick Cage Stay performance. Um, four is the Big Lebowski, more than the sum of its parts. Uh, and then five is No Country for Old Men, not because it's necessarily the crowd pleaser, but because I can remember every shot of that film, like every individual scene, like is sort of burned into my mind. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and that's what a movie should do. <sighs> uh, so. If, I want to take issue with your list because of the Tarantino thing, but I can't. Yeah. This, is, this is the great disappointment of my day, that <laughs> I, I was given an opportunity to shit on you as you did me, and I can't. There's just nothing in there. I yeah. mean, that's a good... Even, that's a, fuck, that's a good list. Fine. That's the list. We'll rate beers with it. <laughs> I would have put Fargo. It's fine. Oh, you left Fargo off. There's a thing. <laughs> well, no, it's in between okay, the stop. integers. Right. It's not off of the list. <laughs> right. It's just not quite a solid five. We're going like to go four point nine. We're going to go get beers and talk about other stuff now. <laughs> well, we'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Caleb, I'm really looking forward to you reviewing this beer with that wonderful list you've put together. So tell me what it is you're drinking and what you like about it. He's going in for it right now. 
I am drinking a James E. Pepper 1776 ale. And this is just going to be a uh, patriotic episode uh, because that's a hard no country for old men. Whoa. It's an American brown matured in oak, aged in rye whiskey barrels. It's a 10.4%. Now, the thing with browns is they often fall into the Pilsner trap for me, which is like, that's a brown, all right. Nothing or, in there. Yep. Yeah, that's a Pilsner. Mm -hmm. Sure, it tastes like one. Right. And it's sort of the, you know, bait the chicken of beers. Sure. Um, not this one. This is uh, very, very tasty and mm. uh, intensely drinkable for being a 10.4. I am going to have this. And while I try this, why don't you tell everybody what we're talking about? So we're going to start off, as usual, dissecting our fun. And we're going to talk about a game that, having owned it for two years, we just managed to beat. Uh, what do you think about that? That is quite good. I don't know that it's a... It's probably more of a Big Lebowski for me. Eh, that's fair. I, I have to do a five, though, because... I don't get many browns I like. No, that's totally fair. Um, so in Dissecting Our Fun, we're going to talk about a game we just beat to fights back. I've owned it for two and a half years yeah. now, at least, uh, which is The Grizzled. Um, and the fact that I've been playing it this long to beat it this late right. uh, probably says something about its design sensibility that I haven't quite unpacked yet. Right. And I figured we might as well do it here in the podcast. And to be clear, it's not that it's taken us this long to beat it because we've played it so few times. We've probably played the game 25 plus times. Yeah, it's a quick game. Years. Yeah, it, 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 it really is probably a 15 to 30 minute play, right, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And you'll know very quickly if it doesn't need to be a 15 or 30 minute play. You'll know after two or three turns that the, that the game has ended, <laughs> even though it hasn't technically ended. Yeah. So um, it, it has been a feat of strength, just a, a Sisyphean almost, in the efforts to try to beat the Grizzled. And yet, for some reason, on my birthday, only a few days ago, we fucking beat that game. So anyways, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of like the, the, the theme of the game and the game design, and then we'll get into kind of like strategies for or what, how, how you kind of play the game effectively. So The Grizzled is a World War I game where you all play French soldiers, uh, and you basically take a character. You have an individual character power. Um, and I bought it at Gen Con two years ago because it just came out. Um, it's also been released by uh, the – it was also featuring art from one of the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists slain in the Tragic Attack. Um, and so I got I did it. I not know that. Um, it's excellent art, uh, excellent work. The game basically involves um, you have your character with your character skill, and then you have uh, two decks. You have a morale deck, and you have a trials deck. Um, the trials deck, if you get through to the bottom of it, you get to peace, and you all collectively, cooperatively win the game. And the morale deck, if the morale deck empties first, you lose, and you're all dead, and you get a monument. Um, so... The basic premise is the mission leader uh, will have to draw a certain number of cards. They say how intense the mission is. Everyone puts that card out on the table. Uh, then you have to put the cards down. The cards will have two of six threats on them. So it will be like oh, a... Two or more. Yeah, two or more. It'll be like a whistle and snow or rain and a bullet or a clear day and a gas mask. Gas mask. Yeah. Um, and they will be in any combination of that. Or they will be all six. Or they will be three. Or they will be something like that. And the premise is the mission fails if three of any individual threat are out at any time. Mm -hmm. So if you have three snows, three bullets, three whistles, three gas, whistles masks. gas masks. Right. And then there are additionally trauma cards which go on your character. The traumas will add things to it every single round, every single mission. So you might get a trauma where you have like a phobia of shells. You get shell shocked. Yep. And now that's one shell to add to everything else that you're playing. Yeah. Um, and it is just bafflingly, perplexingly hard. Like yeah. for people who are even really good at games. Part of the problem... Uh, well, ahead. there's also uh, traps, right? Mines. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah. if you draw a card that has a trap symbol, you draw another card instantly and play it right. without any way to anticipate. No freedom of choice. Yeah, no freedom of choice. Uh, there is an optional rule for newbies to not use those cards or not to have that rule in effect. Right. Uh, did you when you won? Did you have that rule in effect? Yeah, not? we played with traps. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is an accomplishment. That's what well, we're we played here. with three people. Yep. And the game, what we've realized, the game may be unwinnable at four people. Just because of the sheer nature of having to pull a card. Yeah, we've, lear we've learned two things kind of that go beyond just the content of the game, the theme of the game. Two, two things about playing the game. One is number of people is important. The right number of people is important. And two, 
um, that thing you mentioned about being able to determine the intensity of a mission that the mission leader gets to do at the beginning of a round, those two things seem to be, to me at least, the most important elements of the game. So first, we've played the game with three people, we've played the game with four people. Unwinnable with four people, because what happens when you have more people sitting around the table is, is you that draw more cards. You draw more cards, and that's in. So you're drawing more cards out of the morale deck, mm -hmm. right? And that is a that is a. Well, you're drawing more cards out of the trials deck, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You draw out of the trials, but uh, but you can withdraw early if you have cards that are going to end the mission. That's right. And every time you withdraw, you're adding cards from the morale right. into the trials. It's like giving up, and so then you lose some morale. Yeah. Um, the trick with four people is that for every person you add to the number of people playing the game, you also add someone who is adding one of those six threats yeah. to a turn. And so they're every time two threats that's right. every turn. That's right, because they're yeah. adding like a setting like snow or mm -hmm. rain, and they're also adding either the gas mask or the whistle or the bullet. And so they're adding two threats every turn. So it's been unwinnable for us at four. It was it's been unwinnable at three. Um, but we want it while playing with three because we're getting, you know, at, at some point exponentially less threats on the table, mm -hmm. right? The other thing that's really important then is choosing mission intensity at the beginning of the game. So at the beginning of each round, the mission leader gets to choose how difficult is that mission going to be. And that determines, as you said, the number of cards that each person takes into their hand mm -hmm. to start the turn. Uh, in the past, we've had kind of a shoot the moon strategy, like go as many cards as you can to get as many cards in your hand and out of the trials deck to get to the bottom of the trials deck sooner. But the problem is that when you have so many cards in your hand and there are enough people sitting at the table, all of you are going to have to give up lest you put down a third matching symbol of any type of threat more quickly. Yeah. And when you withdraw with cards in your hand, you move more, more cards over from the morale deck and you deplete the morale deck. So our shoot the moon strategy wasn't working, and so we were really measured in our approach this last weekend. Yeah, we were pulling three cards at a time, no more, no less, and making sure that when we withdraw, there was never more than three still on the table. That's right, because you have to put three down, even if there's one left. That's right. But if you have four, now you're putting four down, five, five down. Yeah. So you can't leave that many cards on the table. Um, so really, you have a you have a narrow window of zero to three, right. in which you can withdraw and call the mission a success, and still perhaps get a a net increase in cards yep. that you went through but it's proved like the game requires a lot of table talk there's there's cards that silence your character so right. you can't talk like and like coordinate with people which is absolutely crucial you've got these lucky charms abilities that eliminate certain things from the hand or yeah. speeches that eliminate things from the hand and you know you've got cards that take those away right it's it's a brutal game so like now that we talked about the mechanics of it, yeah. why have we come back to this? Whereas there are other brutally difficult games that we have not played nearly as much. Sure. Say for like uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, which yeah. is another great game One that of my we favorites. liked, yeah. but bafflingly difficult yes. at times. Yeah. yeah, the win rate is so absurd yeah. that, that even I, who loves the game, thinks it's one of the better games ever put together, the Reiner Kinesia one. I don't even want to play it all the time because it's like, no, I would, enjoy, I would like to win today. Yeah. Um, part of the reason I think we keep coming back to it is... Two reasons, I guess. One is because I'm really fucking frustrated we hadn't beat it, and it's, <laughs> and it's really just annoying. It's kind of weighing on me. It's antagonizing me a yeah. little bit. Um, the second reason, and and I, you know, I think this is kind of interesting for people who like to play games because they think there's a very methodical, fairly material way of min maxing, of determining a best strategy based on number of cards on the table, etc. The game should be infinitely winnable because at some point. You should be able to say, well, if we can get down to this few cards in our hand and withdraw and move this many cards from the morale deck to the trials deck, we should be able to, to beat that number over time as long as we can avoid any major mishaps. So there's something that seems very winnable about the game at its core that I just couldn't fucking figure out. And I don't think I have figured it out. I'm not saying that because we've beaten the game, the gates have opened up and now I'll never lose the game again. But rather that um, I feel like the thing that I thought always existed in the game, which is this like very obvious strategy, which is just keep your number of cards on the table down. Don't have to sacrifice yourself to the trials deck as many times. If you can do that long enough, you'll win the game. I just never seen it happen. And so I wanted to fucking see, you know, it's like when I used to play Magic the Gathering. I yeah, in theory, this should work. Right. Why hasn't it worked? Right. Yeah. I, I wouldn't build effective decks. I would build decks that had, you know, nine or ten different tricks that needed to go off. Yeah. And then I would play endlessly, and I would lose, and I would lose, and I would lose, just to find that one instance in that which all draw. nine of yeah. those, you know, kind of like Rube Goldberg devices <laughs> worked together, and I got to play one trick I'd worked infinitely hard for. 
But the whole time I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the deck going, I know all the pieces are in here, and I know that if things just happen the right way, it's going to work. And so I think in some ways that's what I've been stuck on in the Grizzled, knowing there's a clear, ideal objective of the game and just not being able to fucking get to it. Yeah. Uh, I think speed's also a factor and simplicity. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not simple in the rule set necessarily, though I have seen more complicated card games by a mile. But the graphic design of the cards... Setting the cars up, you can get a game of Grizzled started real quick, right? Um, and they're beautiful, and they're and and they're beautiful, engaging cards. Uh, so there might be a thing if you're going to make the Dark Souls of card games, perhaps make it easy to set up yeah. with an easy to read. Fucking a. Um, so that might be another factor. The other thing is theme. Like it's very much based on World War One, and it's not like historically accurate in right. that. It's like trying to you know trying to depict the psalm or anything yeah but it is you know brutally difficult and somewhat capricious right and like had, had it been a card game about like a water balloon fight i'm not sure i would have dedicated as much like i think i've been like why the fuck is this game so hard it's yeah. about a water balloon fight yeah, exactly but at one point like if the theme is like world war one it's like oh that was probably a lot harder yeah. than playing a card game so i should probably be happy that it's that probably did just a card suck. game i'm losing repeatedly yeah um yeah so i think theme is also sneaky important in getting me to play it over and over sure thing yeah i'd recommend it for people who are really into a not getting frustrated when they lose and b who are really into trying to reduce a game to its simplest parts and then see if that works right who can see past theme sometimes who can see past all of the smoke and mirrors and say well really what's happening here is it's a trading game or an economics game we're trying to get fewest number of cards in hand so we can move minimum number of cards over and see how many times we can outlast mm -hmm. fate or you know the yeah. other fucking countries in the case of you know <laughs> world war one um so if you like those kinds of games if you're not in it for bright colorful fun but you're in it for the strategy the thinking around and the coordination i think the grizzle is probably a really good fit and for if you beat it with four people please write down play by post of right. which specific cards you played because i don't believe you you know what? i just want it to be yeah. perfectly clear i don't believe you've done that. yeah actually video or it didn't happen is yeah. how i feel about that <laughs> so i've set the set the stakes pretty high uh you're welcome to send video to us at any point <laughs> um on that note that's our review of the grizzled uh i'm gonna grab a beer and we're moving on to beer number two hey spence what are you drinking so this is uh from omegong and it is the Rosetta. Now, we have to remember uh, the, the Omegang Three Philosophers, which was a... Hard five. I think at, at the time, it was kind of like a conflux of two things. We had both tried it, and someone had recommended it to us, unbeknownst to us. So yeah. the Omegang Three Philosophers. We were trying it at the time they were recommending it, and we were fucking blown away by it. It's kind of mm -hmm. become like one of the things we... Really kind of ear -holed me there. That's right, that we play games with. And so anyways, um, a good friend of mine, uh, Dylan Whitaker who I think, you know, I'd introduced to the three philosophers. Last week he said, you need to find the Omegong Rosetta, an ale aged on cherries with other natural flavor added. If anyone knows how to use a cherry, mm -hmm. it's Omegong. Mm -hmm. And, my goodness, um, it's 5.6%, and it's absolutely fucking delicious. Look, I'm not one for screwing up um, parabolas, but this is a five for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to blame you for picking a five out of the gate for screwing up where we are. How many beers we had now? Like U curve. Oh, I don't know. Um, episode 15 at six beers. That was 90. So we're going to be, we're going to have some Texas sharpshooter at some point. Yeah. Here. We're going to have some runs. Yeah. Like it's going to happen. Right. We found one. I think. I'm not looking forward to the episode where it's all ones and twos. Right. Cause that's, I know that's coming. Right. I know that's in Sponsor, my future. Sponsored by Stillwater. <laughs> I would, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Stillwater, if you're listening. Um, this is the mix so, six bringing you grocery store brand beer. That's right. <laughs> so, Anyways, this is delicious. Um, it's uh, it drinks very light on the front end. It almost has a, a carbonation to it. Um, it drinks like a soda, uh, and it's got you can taste the cherry. Definitely a little bit of tartness on the back end and some sweetness. So, highly recommend this. Uh, and thanks, Dylan, for pointing it out. And while I drink this, Caleb, what are we talking about? In uh, what we're going to talk about today, and this is, was a mistake, which uh -huh. is your number one vote for this episode. It was like 35% of you, yeah, I think. And yeah. Thank you. You really like to, us to talk about mistakes. Right. <laughs> um, we are going to talk about uh, something that is near and dear to both of our hearts. Very important. So um, hosting as an adult is something that I think you should do. I think it makes your home a better place. I agree. You keep it cleaner. You think of design better. Um, hosting guests is nice. Uh, it can be. And it can be. Mm -hmm. But it can also go terribly wrong. Right. Um, and one thing I see it go terribly wrong is 
one of two directions. Yeah. In, in hosting, it will just be come over or come over and eat dinner. Right. And that's it. That's you assume it. we're too adult for right. activities. Uh, and therefore, you get the real awkward. So what do you do? Right. Ne- something to say no you, to that. The party's going wrong if someone's asking. Totally that. agree. Um, or you try and do the activities and the theme thing. Yep. But the theme party, which you and I are huge fans. That's, I mean, that's, that's life. Easy to do wrong. Sure. Easy to screw up a theme party, especially as you're becoming an adult. Yep. And arguably shouldn't be having them right. anymore. But right. Screw those naysayers. You're having a theme party. Just make sure you do it right. That's right. Uh, so, and this was a mistake, much like our yard sale episode, as people who have put on the best yard sale ever. Ever. Um, solved yard sales. We've also kind of solved theme parties. We have the best theme parties. Um, so, um, what do you think about this? What are some do's and don'ts in the world of the theme party? Sure thing. Um, so, you know, and again, you've already done a good enough job of tooting our own horns, but, you know, I want to get one more in there, which is, but, but for some missteps here and there, probably in college, some ill-advised topics and or themes, um, as adults, we've crushed theme parties, Mm -hmm. um, and we've crushed theme parties doing a number of different things too. So it's not just like pick a theme and go forth. It's, it's the themes kind of dictate what you're going to do. So for example, we have theme parties built around movie days, which we do at your house, you know, three to four times a year. So, you know, we had a Fast and Furious movie day where we watched all, well, in theory, all of the Fast and Furious films were on while we had other Fast and Furious themed themes going on. So the food was themed. We had some beer pong, which was themed. We had some other games, themed which were drinks. themed. drinks. Themed drinks. Right. Wasn't there pin the tail on the race car kind of thing? Yeah. 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 yeah there, was a, there was a finish line yeah. on the board. Right. And we spun you around. You had to put the car there. Right. Yeah. Some months ago uh, in March uh, for spring movie day, I think that we did uh, uh, kind of like irreverent war films movie day. And so it was a bunch of yeah. Like, we did a military war day, but it's like in the army now, right? Renaissance uh, Operation man. Dumbo like, Drop. Right. Nothing that could possibly depress anyone, right? And so then you know we had different kind of games throughout the day. You know we had some different activities going on, and then again we had some like fun things around, and the food and the drink were themed. But we've also done non movie day theme parties. So Brandy, for example, is big on Friends Giving every year. Uh, and I would argue that has a theme. Yeah, it, well, especially since last year, she literally made it friends themed. Yes, and everyone got glasses with their own friends' names, and people were encouraged to act like and/or dress like the character with whom they were assigned. Um, and then for Christmas, we did upside down the the chimney, uh, which was a Stranger Things themed Christmas opportunity. I bought a Stranger Things Christmas sweater. Yes, that is amazing. Right. I got a Stranger Things coffee mug. Uh, Mornings are for coffee and contemplation in the Stranger Things writing uh, in our themed gift exchange. So anyways, all of this to say, that's a lot of evidence that we crush theme parties. All right. So why do we crush theme parties and where can you fucking go wrong on the theme party? But evidence that a lot of people don't crush theme parties. That's right. White people in blackface. All over the internet. Don't do that. Don't do that. No. Nope. Nope. Shut that down. People aren't costumes. Right. Um, don't do that. Uh, other. Well, th- I think more broadly. You're not going to defend those. Are no, you? no, no, no. I think, <laughs> no, no, no. The rule should be like don't have a theme that you don't want on the front page of everyone's social media. Seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So. Seems reasonable. Um, so that's like the obvious ones. Yeah. But there are more subtle ones. So, for example, I am against the dress-up theme party. Say the Gatsby theme party where you need to get a fucking tux and stuff like that. Right. Demanding participation before people get to the party and see if the party is good seems like a de-incentivizing mm. act. Mm-hmm. It doesn't encourage me to go. Right. So, like, the Halloween party is ostensibly a theme party. Right. Um, and I, I will, I will uh, give that a slide for being, you know, culturally significant sure. for the costume sure. on that night. But, but in other cases, like in Fast and the Furious Day, had we demanded people dress up in car uniforms right. or like their favorite characters, right? That I feel like that would like discourage attendance, which right. is a party, and you're an adult. You're circle of friends is dwindling right you don't want to d- discourage people there, to come to your party. there's a trick there though like you certainly want to welcome them dre- welcome them dressing up but you don't want to make it mandatory so yeah like yeah do not make it mandatory. when we did when we did 90s kids sports film movie day last year mm-hmm. um you know i wore like sweatbands and headbands and tennis shoes and stuff because i thought well i'm gonna get into this today yeah but but i didn't want to feel pressured to have to get into it in that way if i just wanted to show up in like jeans and a t-shirt and then participate in the shenanigans that should also be okay so yeah definitely don't make the the theme so exclusionary and so pressure intense that before people even get to the party there's stress around the theme i would say another thing is and this one's kind of weird and it's certainly subjective based on where you are in life but 
don't pick a theme that is that is too close to your center. So all of our themes are themes that force us to stretch a little bit. They're not things that we routinely interact with. Stranger Things may be like the one exception there. Yeah. But especially for movie days, right? Like 90s kids sports films. I did not have those in my DVD collection. That's right. Fast and the Furious. You know how hard it is to find the mean green on DVD? Right. Difficult. Yeah, yeah. It is difficult to find that. So Fast and the Furious Day, yes, we fucking love Fast and the Furious. Yes, it is one of our early rating systems and arguably the best best rating system. But we all don't sit around and watch Fast and the Furious Furious, like all of the fucking time. I couldn't tell you the name of a car right. in those movies. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so Camaro. Done. Good job. Maybe. I assume Producer so. Producer Ross, film expert. So what I'm saying is, like, <laughs> pick a theme that stretches you a little bit. What, what you don't want to do is you don't want to throw a party where you're just using a bunch of shit you already have and saying it, it's a theme. Yeah. Choose no. something that you've got to work for a little bit. Make it that, an event for yourself as well as others. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because that forces you to go, you know, kind of get out of your own box, come up with some creative stuff. And that's where the, the creative stuff is really the thing which sets the theme party off. And the other thing, I think you need to think of the theme as... Uh, to bring it back to board games, right? As a board gamer would think, as a board game as the mediating space for the social interaction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're somewhat socially awkward, like I am, glad we don't go over to your house with you, me, Brandy, and Sarah, and just like stare at each other and like, so how was your week? Right. right. Like I would do that, mm-hmm. and I'd be fine with that at this point. Right. But at a certain point, like you do need that sort of mitigating translational right. some theme. forced like, interaction yeah, like some forced interaction also and i wouldn't even call it force i just saw communal like sure. yep. shared yep uh, the, uh mm-hmm. sort of uh rosetta yeah. stone so hey to speak yo. to talk hey in yo. your individual language Topical. um the theme party the best way to think about it is that mm-hmm. like your shitty puns about cars for your food yep potato peel outs Right. Nice. Yeah. Um, those are dumbass. Car tots. Car, okay, well, we were reaching. The tots got really in late. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they were car tots. Uh, and we use that to this day to I, refer to tots. I don't refer to them as tater tots anymore. Yeah. I refer to them as car tots. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just saying that is your mitigating factor. You're going to get people in there. You're going to get them talking. They're going to talk about how stupid it is that you're in your 30s and you're holding a race car themed party for yes. them mm-hmm. and you know what they're going to talk about that they're going to make friends and then they're going to have a good time at your race car themed over 30 party that's right um and that's what it's for like that's the 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 thing about the theme right uh, another thing i would say that if you're putting on the theme party you're the person required to commit to it that's right you can't require outfits you have to go else, hardest but in you got to go hard in the paint right absolutely yeah uh, last thing I'd say about theme parties is, you know, you need to have some focus. So, so it may not sound like it, but a lot of planning goes into these things that we do. In fact, we often plan like months in advance. Like, what movies are we going to watch on movie day, and in what order are we going to watch them, based on how drunk we think people will be when they are in z- different periods of the day. I know we're going to announce this soon, but I'm a little scared about our next theme party. We won't have movie control. Right. No, it's going to be really very brutal. late in the game. It's going to be yeah. really, really brutal. Yeah. But you know what? Well, that's fine. We're going to adapt and overcome. Right. We're going to leave that's that a stretch up. for us. We're going to leave that up to the movie people. parties. Got too easy. That's right. They did. So what I'm saying is, so we plan long in advance what films we're going to watch, uh, in what order we'll watch them what food we're going to bring what activities or games we'll have what going we're going to call the food based on puns yes so so these all these things all seem like well i guess i'll have some people over this weekend and i'll put some stuff on the walls and i'll call it a theme party look you could probably do that but the best theme parties are the one that require some intentionality and some planning you need to focus and become obsessed with the theme for a little bit Dude, one of these things went on for, like, 16 hours. Yes. Like, it, the, we've had some ragers. Like, I've had better parties as an adult yeah. than I ever did in college. Right. Because my theme party game's on point. It's it's on point. And you put enough planning and stock into that day, the last thing you want to do is shut it down early. What yeah. it actually forces me to do, despite the fact that there's alcohol literally everywhere from 9 in the morning on, <laughs> it forces me to slow down a little bit because I want to encounter all of this stuff we spent time putting together. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of a ride for the people doing it, too. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, definitely make sure uh, that you pick a theme that is a little bit of a stretch for you, that it's also entertaining to you. Uh, make sure you don't pick a theme that you wouldn't feel comfortable other people talking about. Make sure you focus like crazy. Uh, make sure you get people who are willing to buy in, but don't pressure people into doing stuff they don't want to do. And make sure you fucking plan. I think those are kind of like the trick to the, 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 the theme party. And I think the number one thing is just have one. Right. Like, have people over to your place. Right. Like, it's hosting is good for you. Sure. It makes you a better, more empathetic person. You're more concerned about your, your friends' needs. Right. And you've cleaned your place up for them to come over. Like, right. host, host people over yeah. there. Yeah. It's not like a... 
it's not you be selfish about it if you want to like it's a self improvement kind of yeah as someone who never wanted to host people uh, it well hasn't in the last couple of years because like I worry about how the dog's going to interact with him because he's fucking crazy and all that stuff but you're still fantastic at it and but Brandy is Brandy is the best host queen, I've ever queen seen queen host it's yeah. it's uncomfortable for me in fact. But what it's done, because my natural speed is not to have people over to my house that aren't close friends who want to play board games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it has it has actually helped me in some ways because the theme is an icebreaker, like you said earlier. It creates yeah. a safer space. It's where, a mitigating factor. Yeah, everybody's yeah. a little bit awkward when you're all fucking talking about Fast and the Furious films or The Big Green mm-hmm. or Rookie of the Year. And so, you know, we're all on equal playing field here. So, anyways, this was a mistake. That's how to not fuck up theme parties. And with that, it's time well, to grab. Uh, Uh-oh, sorry. Mr. Ross. <laughs> I do have one bit. Um, do you have any idea, uh, possible other ideas for themes? Because it seems like right now all the themes, for the listener at home who may not want to new, necessarily do a movie or TV show themed uh, party, uh, what, like I had an idea of like maybe doing like a rockabilly one, like a, like a 1950s sure. uh, one. Do you, are there any other possible suggestions you could give people for places to get inspiration? I think for, for our likely listeners, board yeah. games would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, games in general. Oh, um, like a, maybe like kids board games, like a Monopoly, like a yeah, clue. that'd be great. Yeah, uh, uh, if you, it, it really depends on the context of your friends. Like, yeah, I typically like if I meet people who's just like never hear of any movie I reference, we don't typically right. meet up again. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, that's, okay. yeah. Just that's the nature of friendship, I think. Yeah. a little bit. Uh, so, like, look to your contacts. So, if it's like if you and the guys are down at the war gaming store, like a Warhammer 40k. <laughs> like theme party could be hilarious. It could be bananas. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, I kind of want to do, right. do that. It could, be, it could be the fucking best. I know nothing about Warhammer for it, but I'd fucking show up. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I'd read enough to be able it's to do that. That's where the, the phrase party. Grimdark comes from. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. I mean, if you're going to, like, we're going to decorate my house like a fucking metal album. Yeah. You're going to come. We're going to drink regular beer, but we're going to call it, like, yeah. not regular orc beer. Orc spleen <laughs> blood. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just, you know, be ridiculous. And then have some beer pong in the garage. Yeah. And play some quarters somewhere, and then you're good. You've and got call it. them something else. Yeah, right. yeah, call them something else. Uh, target practice. That, oh, yeah. There you go. With Nerf um, and yeah, so, uh, yeah, you've got all sorts of things. It really depends on the context of yep. of who you're with. And I mean, who you like, want to invite. Yep. Yeah, like in, in grad school, like we've had some obscure literary theme parties. <laughs> and I can't imagine what like grad school is like for art degrees or mm-hmm. theater degrees, mm-hmm. like uh, for that instance. Um, so, yeah, it really depends on the context of where you're at. We can't give you specific ideas because I think, last point, a theme party that's forced... It's no theme party at all. Theme, That's a, a party. big mistake. It's not a party. If you read it on the internet, if you're taking it from somebody else, right. don't do that. Yeah. Or, or at least make it your own. Make right? it your own. It's you got to make be it your, your thing. You've yeah. got to be into it. So get into it. Um, figure out what works best for the people you want to invite. Uh, I think you can pull from literally anywhere. We happen to pull from you know uh, TVs and, and movies because TV and movies because that happens to be like most of our conversation. Yeah. But we're certainly open to changing that. And at some point, we're going to run out of good movie days ideas, and we're going to have to switch anyways. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's kind of where we are. Anyways, with all that said, time to get another beer. Time to talk about something else. We'll be back in just a second. What you drinking? I'm drinking a Dogfish Head Sea Quench Ale, which is a session sour. Session sour. Not a great word for the kid with the speech impediment. No, you did. You did really well. I know. There, I man. really thought about it though. Yeah. I could see you stretching for that one a little bit. And it is a. Well, he's not. Yeah. It's a three. Call him three. Yeah. Yeah. You called it. It's a raising. It's Arizona. a raising Arizona. Nailed it. I'm not gonna like spit it out. By any means. Well, if it's on, I'm going to watch it. If it's in front of me, I'm going to drink it. Sure. But yeah, it's a three. It seems reasonable. Yeah. Uh, I want to describe it a little bit. What are you getting here? Um, it's a sour, but it's canned, mm-hmm. so a little metallic on the back end. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really do the sour quite the justice I want. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you've just exposed me to like the peak end of sours in in your sort of evangelicalism right. forum. Yeah. Um, but after after some of the ones we've had previously in the podcast, sort of falls a little flat, a little too carbonated for me. Oh, okay. Uh, a little too bubbly, sort of cutting into the sour hmm. uh, more than I'd like. Yeah. Okay. So three is where it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this segment, Ask Mixed, Mixed Six, so we're actually kind of lucky here, two people asked... Mm, roughly similar versions of the same question, right? 
So Copernic it's a combo. Yeah, it's a combo. Can we get like a fighter game or sound effect for that, Ross? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll think about it. That means right. no. Cool. <laughs> great. Great. Uh, just make one up in your minds. Uh, so Copernicus Crane asks, "What makes a good seasonal, in this case, summer alcoholic drink, in your opinion?" And kind of looking for what characteristics are most important to you. And then Ethan Cordry. Uh, which kind of says variety is the spice of life, and a lot of your highest recommendations are for fairly unusual flavored beers. But I think you'll agree that not every hard five is an everyday drinking beer, which is absolutely Clearly true. Agree that right? Yeah. We've most learned, hard five. We've are. learned that with milf. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where would you instead locate the perfect balance of reliable enjoyment and consistency? And Ethan, the reason I threw you into this uh, ask mix six is because uh, we have a hard answer for the one beer we drink if right. we can only drink it's Rattler yeah right? it's the Boulevard Ginger Lemon Rattler yeah it's it? oh god right. Ooh, right so good which we've talked about at length but but we want to talk about in kind of a more specific targeted sense in today in terms of as it is a seasonal beer <clears throat> right it's a seasonal beer but also what makes it so perfect right why the five rating and what what are those characteristics that we look for and then by extension other people can look for when they're looking for a good seasonal beer so yes it's the Boulevard Ginger Lemon Rattler it's nearly perfect um, but what makes it so perfect? So let me tell you, as I was kind of thinking about this, why I like the Rattler. In in particular, why I like the Rattler in the spring-summer months. All right? So one, it's really fucking light. Super light. In the winter, there's something about the cold. Um, there's something about the time of the season. I'm looking for things that I can drink less of but arguably have more flavor, which is why in the winter I'm looking for coffee stouts. I'm looking for milfs. I'm looking for pumpkin ales in yeah. the fall, right? Uh, and these are things that seem to be very topical and seasonal, but they also tend to be higher in alcohol and a little bit heavier to drink. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be able to drink less of them, but still get arguably as drunk, which is why many of them have higher alcohol levels. Yeah. In the spring, summer, though, I want to be out playing bags. I refuse to say cornhole because I'm an adult, so I want to be out playing bags. <laughs> I want to be playing beer pong. I want to be sitting on a patio. Um, or I want to have like long Friday afternoons or long Saturdays where we've got the house open and we're playing board games. And that is about that is the, about the ability to sustain. I don't want to count how many I've had. Right. That is the ability to sustain a drunk yeah. over time. And so ginger lemon Rattler is light. It's easy to drink, and I can have two hundred of them before I feel like I've had too many. Yes. Um, and so drinkability is a major, major, major part of how I define a really good. In this case, summer. Season. I normally will drink something else first, and then switch to Rattler just to keep it going. Sure. Like because it's like a four percent something. Yep. Like it's a solid low level. But, yeah, I, I, I really like a Rattler for that. It's it's good for any weather. Yep. Like a little cool yep. spring day. It's good for a hot summer day. Right. I can drink a, I, I, I can drink that mowing a lawn. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, and, uh, but here's the thing. I've also found that Ginger Lemon Rattler, it's a great beer for people who don't like beer. Right. Like, so another thing that's into the number five, I can only drink it ever again, drinkability as a seasonal summer beer is that everyone's drinking it with me. Right. Like, and um, producer Ross, you're not a huge beer guy, and I know Aaron and other people at the RBPR are not. And they've had some good experience with Rattler as well. Yeah. Aaron, yeah, Aaron, uh, RPPR's Aaron does not drink beer. Mm -hmm. He hates the taste of beer. He will only drink ciders and wine right. and sake. Uh, but he li he, he'll drink Rattler. Right. So, because it's uh, fucking delicious. Yeah. And I won't drink half the shit Aaron will drink either. Like, it's not like. I am like going down to a level or anything. His ciders, all the sickly sweet stuff, the Smirnoff stuff. Yeah. I hate it and disgust me for the most part. Rattler's literally the portion in that Venn diagram where we agree. And like it's sort of communal. That's what I want in a summer sort of beer. Yep. And that's what it gets. So we've answered Ethan question. Yep. Like if if we're going for sheer drinkability, what do we go for? And we've we've answered that emphatically. Yep. What can we extrapolate from the Rattler example into what makes a good seasonal beer, a yeah. beer which exists at a time in a place, right. as you said? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Barrett standard. Yeah. Um, so one is, and we've already, I've already talked a little bit about this, that I am uh, – so we live in the Midwest, and I like that we live in the Midwest because Midwest we get four seasons. Yeah. And so the things that come with those seasonal changes – are important to me. I think they're they're fun, right? It's like the spice of life, and it changes as does the weather. And so for me, one of the things I'm looking for in a good seasonal beer is does the beer reflect the palate of the season? So does the pumpkin ale, right, which is in a time of pumpkins, reflect the palate of the season? Does the Rattler feel like it belongs when it's you know 68 to 72 degrees outside and it is a light spring day or a light summer day, and I am drinking a light, refreshing beer? And in the winter. Yeah, we've got at least two hard fives that are 
Yeah. That are seasonal. Totally. Yeah. Well, three with MILF, right? Oh, yeah. MILF, in, yeah. in the winter, does it reflect the kind of like hardy huddle up inside your house and stay warm uh, next this to a fire? This beer fireplace? is my food. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Th- this beer is, is, is giving me warmth by way mm-hmm. of having been all of the carbohydrates or whatever it is yeah. I need to stay warm. Um, yeah. So I'm looking for... I'm looking for it to reflect, and I know the palate of the season is a really terrible term, but I don't have a better one right now. So. No, it, it's the only term you could have. Right. But here's the thing. For me, a seasonal can go too hard into that paint. Sure thing. Like, we're a peppermint cranberry. Yep. Like, no, I don't care how Christmassy it is. Get it the fuck out of Those the, flavors don't go together. Absolutely right. You need something of the palate of the season, but when you try and incorporate ever, like, oh, we're a turkey gravy beer. No. Right. Don't do that. You're an affront to God and man. Right. Um, well, on even a simpler level, I mean, we've talked at length about how that, that in some ways the Schlafly Pumpkin Ale is such a unique five because there are not a lot of other pumpkin beers I even want to drink. Yeah. No, it's... And so it's, it's a clear field right. between Schlafly and everybody else. Right. So, yeah, I, committing to or reflecting the palate of the season is not the same as selling out to the palate of the season. Yeah. That, that also, here's your turkey. Um, so that's important to me. The, the, the other thing that's important to me, I guess, in terms of seasonal is um, every seasonal I like seems to be very distinct. And so maybe, maybe this is a seasonal issue. Maybe it's the palate of the season thing. I like variety. Um, I don't want to. Maybe drink. it's a tight competition space. Like if you're competing to be the beer of the season, right? Yeah, that's I think a that's, stiff competition. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Yeah, that's probably. If you want to be would... a beer that represents my time in this space. Yeah, there's only one of them that's going to get there. That's what. That's the better way of saying what I was going to bumble around for two or three minutes. That's absolutely <laughs> right. That you need to not only be distinguish distinguishable by way of being a seasonal, but you need to stand out in the category. Yeah. And those beers happen to stand out in the category for us. So I think that's probably really good. Anything else stand out to you as what makes a great seasonal? For thinking from the brewer's perspective, of which I have a li- very limited experience to yeah. because of the bonus episode, but I would say that like I really want a seasonal to be a good beer that you decided would sell better in that season Mm -hmm. or a good beer, which because something was in season, you could not produce without what the ingredients you did. Oh yeah. Rather than a beer that we produced specifically for the season. Yeah. I think anytime it comes like, Oh, we need a Christmas beer. We need the spring. We need an Easter beer. We need a spring break beer. Anything like that. It never goes well when you're trying to cater the taste to a specific time. Yeah. I think if you have like a gr- delicious beer, it's like, oh, we need ginger and lemon, so it's going to be in the summer. Yeah. That's a great like, idea. Yeah. Don't, don't let the tail wag the dog. Yeah let, yeah. yeah. let God decide the beer taste. Amen. And then you try and fit the bill. Don't right. don't go around the other The way. only time Caleb Stokes has ever let God decide anything, maybe. Yeah. yeah no, that, no, that I'm makes, still not comfortable with Right. It. That makes some <laughs> sense to me. I think that's a really good point, which is maybe why, you know, when I think about some of the seasonals I like the best, it they happen to be seasonals because they're great beers and there's some value in limiting their availability, but also because it's literally just the right time of the fucking year to get those types of ingredients and make them work for you. Yeah, and I'm not a brewmaster or anything, but I imagine freshness is also a factor in like sure what you're is. putting in things. Sure like it is. For all those hardcore foodie people with Oh, gutter pallets uh, like my own. Like right. uh, I, I imagine that has a serious effect on beers. And I know there's been seasonal pulls of beers that I've been not crazy about. Like I'm not crazy about this round of Schlafly Pumpkin Ale compared to the one before. Right. Um, and uh, Mother's Blush. Yeah. Did not like the first round of that. Right. Love that. Now yeah. the pomegranate hibiscus. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's a matter of like ingredient quality. Yeah. Um, and it gets seriously farm to table. Winter gr- even mother's shit. winter grind. I mean, you know, changes from year to year. Oh yeah, kind of coffee. Nature, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of nature of the thing. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that also the other half to the other part of seasonal beers there is you kind of have to embrace the variance in some of them mm-hmm. because you are tying your wagon uh, to you know a seasonal ingredient, and those things are going to change with time and climate and environment. Yeah, and then brewing process because you're not brewing it the same way you've brewed everything that is your day to day kind of like flagship beers. So for me, those are the great things that make a seasonal. Uh, and and you know to answer Copernicus, Copernicus Crane's question, you know we're looking for something which reflects clearly the time of the year, uh, which, which is not beholden to. That's it. right, but it not but it's not dictated by it. Um, which uses you know ingredients which have some variance and flexibility because they are unique to that season and you know more to Ethan's point then what what of all of the fives that we've given out makes that kind of like perfect middle of the road you can drink it and love it and it's the Boulevard Ginger Lemon Rattler which happens to also be a seasonal mm-hmm. and, and and that is not a transitive property of beer because they make uh, a another Rattler uh, which is like a pomegranate blood orange or something and that's like a th- 
two, three for yeah, me. Yeah, probably a hard two for me. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's not even just that I'm into that it category. Yeah, I'm it into that beer transition. at that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and with that, speaking of beer, I'm gonna grab another one. We're on to something else. Spencer, what are you drinking? This is Second Shift Brewing's Green Bird Goza. Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Not for me. Um, uh, yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a Hudsucker <laughs> proxy. That's a two. Uh, I don't hate it, but I don't like it. Um, it has too much of like a badly filtered wheat beer taste for me to give a shot yeah um it feels like they intentionally undercut the the goza aspect of the whole thing and so no it just kind of tastes like a i much prefer my dog i'm happier with my three here well that's how yeah yeah so two to three i mean it's it's a solid two to me so if you're looking for like a really light goza that more tastes like a mild filtered wheat beer uh, and has a little bit of tartness on the back end. Second Shift Brewing's uh, Green Bird Goza is for you. Just doesn't happen to be for me. So while I um, meander through this, what are we talking about? Another combo. Combo. Hey, Bring back uh, that uh, noise effect. Noise yeah. effect. There we go. Um, you can reuse notes. the first one. Yeah. yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> really wonderful. Uh, so, Jake Derby asked us, uh, what makes a creative work become so bad that it's good instead of just bad? Which I love. Whereas Maddie Gibbons trolled us by suggesting we watch the films of Neil Breen, of which I have watched already too many. Um, <laughs> so, in Nerdsplainer, your second place vote for segment this week, mm-hmm. we're going to talk about the nerdy obsession with bad movies. And... Um, It occurred to me in preparing this episode what my uh, crux is on this. So your Sports Planet episodes, obviously, great. uh, Awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel, feel, I'm going to be honest, I feel a little bit of envy, a little bit of inadequacy coming up against the Sports Wow. And what it appears to be is that I think that the problem is, is that you're working in what is very much a hard science discipline. You're going for like statistics, I am. like it's empirically observable. Yeah, it's empirically right. observable. Where That's I'm right. going yeah. for like this sort of amorphous thing. I'm playing sociologist. Yeah. So I'm gonna again. Well, it's aesthetics, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna again go to um, aesthetics, ethics, sociologist with nerd splainer and talking about the difference between um, shit cinema. Now you have some familiarity with this, right, sure. Spencer? Like, yeah. So could you help the listeners and where you're at with? Movies you've watched specifically because they're bad? Yeah, for sure. So at the top of the list, and I don't actually know that we've talked about The Room all that much, but at the top of the list, you know, is kind of The Room for me, a, mm-hmm. f- a film that is distinguished only because it's so bad that, that other people far more important than us have picked it up and have kind of made a cultural phenom out of it. Uh, and it was introduced to me some years ago, I think in 2011, by Zach and Tala, who were kind enough to say, oh my God, you've not seen The Room, which after you watch The Room, is your response to everyone who hasn't seen The Room, as if, like, (laughs) wait, you aren't in on the thing I wasn't in on? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, I certainly have some experience with with this this idea that there are some things that gain favor or credibility because they should not have gained favor or credibility in the first place. Yes. Yes. I've not seen anything by Neil Breen, uh, and I am more than ready to dive into what looks like a... a, (laughs) I disagree. (laughs) A lengthy, in-depth, exceptional assessment of what it is you think the distinguishing features are here. So, look, I think when you're obsessed with things that are uh, so bad they are good, Mm -hmm. outside of the being exposed to a couple of things that are so bad they are good and sort of getting on board with it. But when you actively seek that out, as producer Ross and I do, and producer Ross especially, hunting down the best of the worst uh, in in every case. I have a whole theory. Yeah. Uh, So my theory is this. There are two ways in which to enjoy uh, cinema, specifically, in that they are terrible. Mm -hmm. And for me, they define from two definitions. So we're going to go to Milan Kundera here, uh, the author of Unbearable Lightness of Being, Mm -hmm. um, and his definition of kitsch. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kitsch as 
any production in which shit is denied and everyone acts as though it does not exist. Mm-hmm. That is not literal shit. Mm-hmm. It is in which uh, excludes everything from its purview, which is essentially unacceptable in human existence. Sure. So, like, intensely commercial stuff, intensely group designed, consensus designed things that sort of negate artistic purpose entirely. Mm-hmm. Like, have no comment on the human condition. They are just existing to exist sure. by market forces. Right. They, 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 they have built-in blinders that are purposefully built in to be blinders. Yeah. Um, I think kitsch is uh, intimately related to the American concept of camp, uh, which the dictionary defines as a something that provides a sophisticated knowing a set amusement as by virtue of it being artlessly mannered or stylized, self-consciously artificial and extravagant, or teasingly ingenuous and sentimental. Mm -hmm. So I think the majority of geek enjoyment of things that are so bad that they are good is taking kitsch and making it into camp. Taking this thing that's sort of unknowingly, unapologetically, uh, unaware of how like market-obsessed and sort of banal it is and how meaningless it is, and sort of making it camp by sort of ironically detaching yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or, to be more sophisticated, this is the MST3K right. of uh, observing a movie and riffing on it. So you have, like, um, shitty Star Wars ripoffs, of which MST3K and Rift Tracks have done millions of, mm-hmm. in that Star Wars is popular, let's make a sci-fi film that we think is Star Wars, right. and then fail spectacularly with a bunch sure. of stupid sure. comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, or you have uh, from the more Star top- Crash would be a good example. Star Crash would be With that. Days of David Hasselhoff, you know. So. Yeah. Hey, yo. um, or the recent MST3K Avalanche, mm-hmm. which is Jaws was popular. Let's make Jaws. But I have this ski resort, so let's make Jaws snow. Makes sense. And then just watching that fail right. over and over again. Who are the lead actors in that one again? Couldn't tell you. Uh, and let's add a weird. Couldn't tell you. Won't let's tell add you. a weird '70s sexy subplot to it. Yeah. Because you know '70s. Uh, so again, let's make this movie. It's terribly commercial. Sure. So the pleasure in these films, these kitsch to camp films are entirely divorced from the film itself. Yeah. In fact, those films can be agonizing, and they are actually bad if you were forced to watch them by yourself. Sure. Um, but the thing is, MS3-3K does, is that it invites people into your living room to watch that with you. Um, but you, we've also do this by yourself. So we recently watched the Matt Damon, The Great Wall. Pure kitsch exists as a example of international market forces, China, wanting to get into the Western audience. So Matt Damon just appears in this wushu epic where they fight dinosaurs off the Great Wall. Mm -hmm. It is devoid of any human meaning um, and completely absurd, but very easily made fun of, which we did together in a group uh, as RPPR nerds. And the MST3K and Rift Tracks model is like, I don't have friends here at the house. Let's invite them over. And they're professional comedians, so they're even better at transferring this kitsch to camp. And that's the, the... and I would argue this is the bulk of nerd enjoyment of terrible films. So where does and, – and this may be an inappropriate question. You may be planning to cover this. But yeah. where, where does spoof fit in, in in that kind of – so for me, right, there are two levels at which one can watch, for example, The Naked Gun. There's, mm-hmm. there's the, 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 the objective, this is what happens in the movie. And taken at that level, it's a terrible film. That's ridiculous. Yeah. But then there is the, oh, it's ridiculous. We should enjoy its ridiculousness. Well, that, 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 that's actually a straight-up comedy that's just p- applying absurdist sort of Monty Python aesthetics. I mean, that, that's... Yeah, but, but so I get that it fits in that genre. But I yeah. think what I'm, I'm suggesting is that I'm making an argument that it actually functions similarly to, to, in some ways, what you're describing as camp. The question is one of politics. I think it's yeah. a matter of agency. So sure. in the spoof, Politics, yeah. it is the director right. that is taking the kitsch, yeah. the fact that the audience is so deeply aware of these genre tropes yeah. that to make this film that makes objectively no sense right. and to have it still be funny yeah. is sort of a critique of their failure to be more informed sure. consumers. So it's a question of intent in some yeah. ways then. And, yeah. where, and, and, and whereas I think in Kitsch to Camp, it yeah. is very much a failure of the filmmaker to recognize they are making any kind of art. Got it. And being devoid of that and having to rescue that. Well, yep. also the spoofs are, yeah, they're, I mean, they're intentionally making fun of it. Like, you would not see uh, skits that uh, in a Great Wall or a, like, an Asylum film. Are you familiar with the Asylum? Yeah. Uh, where they did Sharknado and they've done all these. They, they, right. they emulate genre films, but they do so 
with a straight face the entire time. They sure. aren't winking at the camera. They know that people are going to yeah. make fun of them. Yeah. And for but instance, they, they those like meet the Spartans, that yeah. fucking yeah. like right. in the moment scary spoof, movie scary movie shit is unriffable. Right. Because it's just stupid and bad and unwatchable. Yeah, but there's a sophisticated version of this. Because like, both people are trying to do the film. Right. Like, both people are trying to take the agency, and in that case, no one has agency. It's just a bad movie. But there's a sophisticated version of that, which is, like, much of Edgar Wright's work, right? Like, Hot Fuzz, Shaun of the Dead. These are spoof films in some way, but they don't feel like, aha, fuck you, Well, those are just, again, you. like, yeah. British Well, they're meta. Comedy. They're simultaneously yeah. aware yeah. of the tropes, yeah. but they never... Oh, yeah, that goes back before they you... They never... Um, get outside the tropes yeah right like it's never it's never mocking the tropes solely do it's mocking the tropes as you do it. right so yeah i would argue that ed wright elevates itself to satire not spoof mm. um but mm. yeah, yeah mm. i mean anyway um what i consider this is that the other type and the type that i think you're more familiar with in the room because yeah. you specifically mentioned it is uh it occurs when you take kitsch and camp and you find that there's no kitsch at all but rather an artistic statement beyond what the filmmaker intended. Mm-hmm. So that's where you get sure. stuff like cult films. So the Rocky Horror Picture Show was originally a cult film because it was considered so bad. It flopped so fucking yeah, hard. For sure. And so drastically that it was considered bad. But in fact, it was just anticipating a sexually liberated zeitgeist yeah. so far beyond its time that like people recognize that. And now it's more like church when you go to a Rocky Horror Picture Show showing. Um, there's nothing campy or kitschy about it. Like it is an audience participation theatrical act, yep. but it is an artistic moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Night of the Living Dead, which is really, you know you know now is the so far anticipated the zeitgeist of the monster and the yeah. horror movie that it was considered you know unwatchable, untrademarkable at the time. Um, but on the other hand, you get these films that are so deeply embedded in the psychoses of the director. They are so intrinsically tied to the horrible, shitty, um, you know, mindscape of the director that they become artistic statements beyond that which the director intended. What? And, and what I'm talking about there is the room is not about seeing what happens to Johnny. Right. No one gives a fuck. Yeah. The room is about seeing what Tommy Wasau yeah. is going to do next. And you're going to guess it's a sex scene. And yes, you were right. right. It was a sex scene. Right. And then it's going to be, I have breast cancer out right. of nowhere. And you're like, what? Right. And then another sex scene as that plot of things. You're, about, you're delving into the mind. And it's really the antithesis of kitsch. It's kitsch that goes so far into the realm of meaninglessness, it wraps back around. Because the director has just shown this integral and almost a, like dirty and kind of dark picture right into the human mind yeah right so you get like bird dimmick's obsession yeah. with hitchcock references and james nugent and yoko ono uh, uh and yoko ono. well uh, well the thing is um this actually goes into a long tradition of art that's called outsider art yeah and this g- goes back like literally centuries and when you refer to outsider art, you refer to someone who is an outsider to the traditions of art. Sure. Someone who not only has no training in art, but is, no matter what exposure they have to culture, is unaware of the basic conventions of it. So someone... Neil who, Breen. Neil Breen, Tommy Wiseau, is also included. And uh, so is uh, uh, the Bredemic director. Uh, James Wynn. James Wynn, yeah. And, and also Neil Breen has his own like archetypal hero's journey. At yeah. this point, like Neil Breen has remade archetypes in his own image, yeah. like because his films, regardless of the topic, followed the exact same through it's, line for the character. It's the artistic equivalent of basically, you know, when two children live by themselves and make up their own language, uh, you know, outside, right. devoid yeah, of yeah. context from the larger culture. Yeah. And so that's why it's important in an, in, a, in an artistic sense uh, to see what they do, because it's sort of. Uh, very, uh, let's see, naive and very innocent and very, and also very revealing of their inner psyche and uh, of their personality, and that's and, why they're really interesting and unique and worth watching. And and that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah. Whereas one side of it is like it's kitschy, it's so deeply informed. Well, they're not kitsch at all. I know they're not. Yeah. But one side of it's it's kitschy, it's so deeply informed by the cultural zeitgeist that you have to sort of rescue it through irony. Right. The other side is like. It's in the same market demographic as those shitty films with The Room and Neil Breen. And uh, you can sort of put it in the same area of kitsch. But in looking for it, you find instead something like deeply human. Yeah. It's flawed. Right. But that flawed 
like brings out the humanity and it's so deeply awesome so like that's the sort of um point in nerd explaining like you need to be careful when you're talking to nerds about something that's so bad it's good right because they don't have the same definition every time yeah um so for instance i think dan can get down with some mst3k and the second it gets into some outsider art he's out so hard it's the funniest <laughs> fucking thing i've ever seen or also absurdism because, yeah like right, anytime right. you get into absurdism anytime you get into like that right. sort of mannered writing in cinema sure yeah yeah, because he's like uh, uh, <laughs> there's a whole thing about him watching rubber. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I've heard about yeah. this. Yes. Uh, he did not respond well to it. So. Right. Whereas the opposite, I think you'd react very well to something akin to the room, like yeah. a Neil Breen. Yeah. And you would be interested in it. Whereas I don't think you'd have any interest in your average MST3K riff because it's just a bad movie yeah. that you're trying to rescue through your own jokes. I think. Yeah. I think. I think they're fine. You know, like I appreciate MST3K a lot. I'm glad that it's back. I'm glad that it has a cultural following. And occasionally, Brandy and I will watch one. And I, I will find myself laughing at the things, but I think that they they lack teeth for me because in some ways it all you're doing is the thing that I would do through a bad, bad movie anyways. Yeah. And so a lot of times I'm even evaluating if that's better than the joke I think I would have made in some ideal universe because mm-hmm. ego and arrogance and all that stuff. And so so it, it the thing that you've introduced as the interlocutor there between the bad film and me is the thing that I was going to do anyways. Yeah. And so it's lost any teeth, right? It, that, that's not a marketing tactic for me. Whereas... Um, reading The Disaster Artist, which is in some ways the same as watching an MST3K film with those guys in the room, which is trying to kind of like make light of what went into or where we've ended up. Mm -hmm. Reading The Disaster Artist, which is the making of The Room by Greg Zestero, the guy that plays the friend, um, that was infinitely fascinating to me because that is not a character arc or backstory that I could have added while watching that film. And the film was so uniquely bad that I was paralyzed by watching it, not (laughs) thinking of jokes to make because the film is in and of itself a joke. So, while those two things should have a very similar function, they have very different functions to me. And I think from your perspective, that's because – I think you've explained this very well. Some things invite a more deep explanation into the human which got you to where you are, you know, the director, the actor, the writer, et cetera. Some of these things are just things which – Are exist. dumb by committee. Right. And, and now, it's and, harder to analyze. And now we, yeah. we, we have pointed out how dumb they are by committee. Yeah. I don't find that all that fascinating. Yeah, no. I, I mean I do only in as much as that's, that's what we do. And so the and, idea and of I other care for, doing it I for care me, for both, right? but like that, I feel like that's not everybody, right? And so, in examining the sort of nerdy obsession with so bad it's good, right? Maybe be clear in: Are you taking something kitschy and yep. transferring it to camp? Yep. Are you sort of like getting into the psychosis of this individual? Director? Absolutely, I think that's a great distinction. Uh, time for more beer. Time for more stuff. We'll be back on the other side. Caleb, what's that beer? I am going to drink a Prairie Artisan Ales Paradise, which has a very vapor wavy label. I love the label. And it is an imperial stout brewed with coconut and vanilla. To be clear, producer Ross just literally almost jumped out of his Liter- chair. Like when almost I said fell over yeah. when you said vapor wave. I've never seen anticipation. My goodness. It's so. Buckle palpable. in, producer so what, Ross. I, is, vapor wave is pretty great, guys. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a playlist on Spotify. It's like 30 hours of vaporwave. Uh oh. Caleb is. That is pretty good. And to be clear, you don't love you some coconut, so. I dislike coconut in the extreme, mm-hmm. and that is still a solid Big Lebowski. Damn. Yeah, really? No, it's pretty tasty. Uh, not too hard as an imperial. It's pretty good. I think we can conclude that Prairie does imperials well, because if memory serves, the bomb is. Prairie a, bomb's a hard It's like a 13%. Just and we're not alone. Fucking like, face. Every every beer thing ever is like this yeah. is transcendent. It's, try that. Yeah, I'm going to try that. While I try that, why don't you tell everybody what we're talking about? We are going to talk about in binge binger a recent obsession of mine. I came through through Sarah, uh, which is uh, he said a meh face. yeah yeah no it's a three four for me yeah, yeah. probably a three. Uh, but you're not a stout guy. I'm a stout guy. Right. Um, so uh, in binge binger, we're going to talk about a television. Spell that was cast upon me. Spell of vision. Through, yeah, spell of vision. Uh, through uh, my loved one, Sarah. To be clear, I've been I've been preaching this gospel for months. You have, and I did not believe it. Yeah, because you preach a lot of gospels. I do. That I don't listen to Arrow. Um, and huh. uh, but Just this one, there. this one, you were dead on about. Yep. The Great British Bake Off, which is 
enchanting, relaxing, and like watchable in a way I'm not sure I can put into words. So I think I can help you put it into words, but they're not mine. But the other day, um, a former student and now good friend of mine who listens to the podcast, an average listener, Caleb Doyle, tweeted the great British baking show cured my anxiety. And I know he was being a little glib, but I know he was also not wrong because I have watched obsessively every season of the great British baking show that I can get my hands on. I've even watched some of Masterclass. Um, And it is the most relaxing, calming, pleasant viewing experience of my life. So for those of you who haven't watched it, A, go watch it immediately. It's on Netflix. You're going to want to watch The Great British Bake Off or Great British Baking Show. You're not going to watch Masterclass yet. Masterclass is like for diehard fans. Don't go into Masters yet. You'll get there. Um, but the premise Paul is... Paul Hollywood and Mary Berry need to be characters to you before Masterclass makes sense. That's right. That's right. So the premise is um, that Paul Hollywood and Mary Berry are two uh, baking icons. Gurus. Gurus, as it were. And they are evaluating a bunch of home bakers who have come literally to a nice tent on some fucking hillside. It's like a really nice tent, It's though. a really nice like it's tent. It's a bomb-ass tent. Some fucking hillside in England... Uh, and they are given a literal pastoral setting. Yes, <laughs> and every episode they are given three distinct challenges in which they have to bake things, and the challenges are in and of themselves interesting. So, um, the first challenge is the technical bank te- or se- signature bake, signature signature bake, where that's something they can prepare beforehand. Yeah, something that the contestants can prepare beforehand, and and you kind of know like what the theme is going to be. So your best biscuits or something. Okay. Mm-hmm. The second round is the technical challenge. And this is where shit gets really fucked up for how pleasant and benevolent and unassuming the show is in the technical bake round. It gets dark. It gets dark. Either Paul Hollywood or Mary Berry, the two gurus who have become who are judges for the show, will ask the contestants to bake something in the vein of like a very fancy, a very famous, or even one of their recipes. Some or version of that. Sometimes it's like an archaic bake. Right. That- no human does anymore and then they'll give them directions but their directions are just giant middle fingers because it will delete random points in the direction and paul hollywood just like well if you were a real baker you'd know to do that right it will it will just say something like make icing or let (laughs) the cake rise and it won't yeah it won't tell you temperature it won't tell you time and what why that's significant is because as someone who likes to cook because i kind of like enjoy the the jazz like approach to cooking it's like i don't know fucking put more stuff in there and see what it tastes like baking is just straight up fucking science yeah there's no wiggle room there's no like i don't know it calls for a hundred grams of a thing maybe i'll try and at 101 it fucking that's right collapses it blows up it literally fucking explodes it turns into one of those like science project volcanoes (laughs) um baking is fucking science and so they take all the fucking science out of the recipes and then in the third challenge which is the showstopper they ask you to some to do something which is like larger than life grand presentation Right, just build a fucking piping, you know, yeah, just four foot tower shit. of yeah. eclairs or some shit. So here, you know, all of this is set in like some sort of like weird chaos. And we in in America are very used to reality television shows that emphasize chaos and hype. The louder it is, the more insane it is, the more conflict there is. This is all fucking perfect for us. This is what we get into. And the Great British Baking Show couldn't be any less that. Yeah, like that's the thing. I don't know if it's intrinsic in the show or my American reality TV upbringing, but my favorite part about the show is every point where there's conflict they could heighten, where there's suspense they could go after, and they just fucking don't. No. At one point, like they're in the middle of a technical, and I can't remember the names because I'm not that, I haven't rewatched seasons right. yet. Yeah. But um, one baker steals a. Uh, icing from someone else unwittingly because the icing looks the same yeah and they icing each other's cakes wrong right and i'm like that's like a six episode fucking arc yes. in any reality TV on show Chef, in america that is a and they're just like out. oh i'm terribly sorry he's like oh that's a damn shame oh, oh and then right. they like hug and then it's over and then they go back to baking delicious looking food yes and it's just so life affirming it's like yes this is the reality i want to live in right whereas most casting directors i think look for the most insane most likely to stir shit up cause drama i think that a prerequisite to getting on this show is not only do you have to be able to bake exceptionally well you also have to pass a politeness test yeah like like do you help an old woman when she drops her groceries in the street if so 
you've passed one gate to getting on this show. Everyone needs to be the nicest. And person. like they're competing and they're like helping each other. Like right. it's like I don't know what this looks like, and they'll literally turn around and be like, "I think it's this," yep. and like share secrets that they could get a leg up on. Right. And it's just so fucking. Li- it, the cast the, is so diverse. They get bakers from every ethnicity and, and religion, and like they don't vote on it it's not like great british bake-off is like oh it's not a british cake right it's not it's not like all cockney and shitty it's just like oh wow that was brilliant it tasted really good who did that it's also blind yep which are, are they at least like make it look blind? right yeah the judges TV. don't know who they're yeah, evaluating. it's also blind it's like this tastes really good and it looks really good who was this yeah like that's great i'm also one, one of the one of the subtle things that makes this show so and and i know that we're talking about we're I, like, I hear what's happening, okay? I know that some of you are sitting on the other side of whatever <laughs> listening device you're on, and you're like, these fucking weirdos are talking at length about why I should go watch a British baking reality you television show. You don't get it. You don't get it yet. And I and that's the weird thing. And, like, I feel, I've never felt more like a fucking whatever I am for saying you don't get it about the Great British Baking Show. But let me give you another thing to get. The music which is a large part of how we experience conflict in this television. This is the most brilliantly scored reality TV show in existence. Fucking fight me about it. It, it all sounds and feels like only the best parts of Matilda. Is if how jo- I feel. Yeah, if John Williams scored it, it right. would be worse. Right. Like, it's pitch perfect right. all and the way through Imagine it. that Mrs. Doubtfire was a real person and made a <laughs> baking show. It would be the great British Bake Off, yeah. okay? It is pleasant. The people are kind. The emphasis is not on conflict. Every time there's a winner announced in the finale, you get the genuine feeling that the people who didn't win don't feel as if they've lost, but rather they're happy for a good friend they've now made in this competition. And, and they're genuinely sad when someone's voted off that's the right. show every time. They would like to win because everyone would like to win. One other thing that I have to say, one other reason to watch the show. The hosts are exceptional. So Just electric. Two British hosts. Um, and the, as far as I can tell, having like scoured the internet to find out more about them, are best known for at one point hosting what looked like kind of a daytime talk show together for a brief period of time have found new life on the Great British Baking Show. And they are they are witty. They seem to be kind. They genuinely care about the people. And when people go home, it seems to disturb them as well. And they understand they how to... trade off the bad news right. job. Because like, who the fuck, fuck wants to do job. that all the time? Yeah. And, and, then, and then by way of production, the show is appropriately paced so that you get a nice dose of both the hosts who are kind of like funny and genuine and natural and also these really wonderful bakers. And then these odd personalities of these baking gurus that are Mar- Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood who have become like... Just, you know, like regular names in my household because now Brandy and I talk about them as if they're in the other room, just like waiting w- waiting on the other side of a door for us. And they will do some like American Idol, like stern face and this looks and this tastes really good shit. But like you can always tell. Yeah. Like that's the thing about Paul Hollywood. He gets yep. that stern face. Mm-hmm. You always know he's going to say something great. Right. And when he's like not stern yeah it's pretty good yeah that's yeah, fine. It's okay or yeah. this is wrong or and that's it but the hosts like there's some genuine sh- who's the shorter one i can't remember her name honestly. mel and uh other woman the ep- I, the episode that got me on board was when they did the like paul hollywood and mary berry go around and watch bakes in progress mm-hmm. and then the host is usually there to comment she refused to comment and she would just take pieces of things that they were baking and put them in her pockets yep. and as the show went on her her blazer got bigger and bigger with like scones she was stealing and she just in silence did that the entire time so subtle i that was brilliant like that's solid like, so brilliant hosts exceptional judges quality individuals that you genuinely want to see succeed and who seem to genuinely care about others succeeding as well a a an earth shatteringly good simple polite score and then what just seems like the most insane shit like this these baking challenges that i can't even fucking wrap yeah my the head fact around. that anyone could cook anything like that that's in right two hours blows my god that's right mind. and as someone who watches you know uh, a lot of like the kind of like big cooking shows the american cooking shows the gordon ramsay stuff used to be a big into iron chef all those things which are built around conflict turmoil and drama to see something in the reality television genre specifically regarding food that is so wildly different than that, it's refreshing, and the whole thing feels refreshing. And I cared nothing for those shows, to be clear. Right. But here's my takeaway from it. I know it's a reality show. Therefore, I know there is artifice. Yep. And I know the artifice is severely 
severely underreported. Yeah. And I know that it's in there. But their artifice is seeking to build for me a world yep. that is more serene, yep. more polite, less competitive, yep. and generally more cooperative than the world in which I naturally live. And that's what art should do. Like, yep. that's just pure escapism. That's exactly And, like, is. I'm watching reality TV, but the... I- the irony is that reality TV has become escapism. Right. You don't watch Flavor of Love because you want a depiction of the way the world really works no. or anything to think very hard. And, you know, if I don't want to think very, very fucking hard and I want to escape with the world, why don't I escape into something pleasant? Amen. Like a wonderful pastoral cow field with a lovely tent where everyone is baking things I want to eat. That's right. Instantly it, from I bet seeing it. it smells fucking delicious in yeah, there yeah. is how I feel. Um, yeah, so I... I don't get why I like it so much, but talking about it with you helps me out. Yeah. But I, Sarah will put it on and be like, and I, I think there's still some middle of a pry. I'm like, yeah, you can put it on. I won't watch it too closely and I'll yeah. do something else. Right. I'm not doing something. I'll else. tell you I'm right now, watching Grave this Fake is, we, we have had a number of people reach out to us after we gave a raving review of Young Justice. And I appreciate all of you for kind of taking us at... at Great British Bake Off is the next that's right. Young Justice. That's right. Young Justice Season 3 is Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood giving you a hard read right. on your scones. That's right. I, I I will recommend it as hard as I have recommended Young Justice on this podcast. And and if that and if that makes me wrong, I don't want to be it's right. It's visual ambient. Go for it. So if if you've been listening to whatever this was for like the last 13 minutes or so and everything which preceded it, uh, <laughs> thanks so much. If you're not continuing on with us because you're not yet a patron, we totally understand and we appreciate